Okay, so uh, thank you everyone again for joining us for the webinar series. Um, our topic today is study drug formulation and supply issues, and it will be presented by Pat Folger. So just a couple of housekeeping items uh, before we get started. So everyone but our speaker is muted. If you have any questions, please use the chat box. It should be on the left hand side of your screen to type questions for the presenter. If you're interested in CMEs, um, you have to complete an evaluation form and we'll provide all the details at the end of the webinar. So for now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Pat Bolger is, is the Director of Clinical and Business Affairs at the University of Rochester's Clinical Materials Services Unit where he provides tactical and strategic support for all stages of clinical trial supply, including project proposals, study kit design, supply chain management, distribution logistics, project management, and regulatory compliance. In addition to practicing hospital pharmacy early in his career, Pat spent over 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry where he was involved in developing and managing systems to comply with federal and state regulatory requirements. He's also led cross-functional product development teams in the planning and execution of strategies to obtain regulatory approval for pharmaceutical products. Pat received a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy from the University of Florida and an MBA in International Business from the Rochester Institute of Technology. So thank you so much, Pat, for joining us today. I'm going to share the slides and um, you should be able to browse at the bottom left. Okay, thank you. Glad to be here. Just waiting for the slides to appear. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. And uh, thank you for the, the nice introduction, uh, Sam. Um, as far as navigating these slides, Sam, I just, oh, I see now, okay. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm uh, happy to be here speaking with everybody this morning, and thank you, or depending on where you are, but this afternoon here at least, um, and uh, be speaking on the, the subject of clinical trial drug, uh, drug supplies. And this slide here just lists out uh, a lot of the topics that we're going to cover during the presentation, <clears throat> single center versus multi-center trials. Um, but then from there on out, a lot of what I'm going to talk about would apply to either a single center or a multi-center trial. Um, but we'll get into how to source your study drug. Um, if it's a, a blinded uh, placebo control trial, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then get into some uh, how the product is packaged, both primary and then secondary packaging. We'll cover the labeling, um, just talk about some issues around um, the, the durations, different durations within the study and how we need to plan for the study drug to be able to accommodate that. Um, and then finish up with some uh, storage conditions, uh, considerations, some logi logistics around distribution, and then what to do at the end of the study. So um, just to clarify here early, uh, single center versus multi-center studies. Uh, a lot of you, you know, may have or may, may actually be a part of an investigational uh, drug service at your institution or, or you know, local to your institution. And that um, activity, when they're sourcing uh, clinical trials that are um, local to that institution, that is um, covered by the practice of pharmacy. So it's a, a single center trial. It's more uh, along the lines of a prescription um, basis. When we get into multi-center trials, it's a lot more industry-like in that we're following a different set of regulations called the GMPs. And we do a lot of things that are, that are more um, batch type activities. So again, <clears throat> the distinguish between single center trials and multi-center trials. And I'm going to cover a little bit more uh, about the multi-center trial here in that those GMP regulations stand for good manufacturing practices. And because we're introducing material into interstate commerce, those are federal regulations. And they're basically quality standards that cover all aspects of pharmaceutical processing um, 
and, and they're the same regulations that uh, the pharmaceutical industry follows as they manufacture and distribute uh, prescription products and devices. The, uh, the, the real you know, uh, important point here within the GMPs is that all activities are, are covered in a, in a sort of there's the person who does the activity and documents that they did the activity and then someone comes behind them to verify that that activity was done. So very much a done by check by type of approach to the uh, processing to satisfy those federal regulations. A couple definitions um, when we're talking about sourcing and, and to start with uh, the study drug and, and to talk about sourcing your study drug, there's the, the drug substance, the, the raw material or the active pharmaceutical ingredient that you need to keep in mind if, if the drug that you're going to study isn't already in a, a dosage form. So sometimes we take that supply chain all the way back to the raw material figure out a, a manufacturer who can convert that into the correct dosage form, get it packaged up. So uh, you have to think about where the sourcing of that raw material is going to come from. And then, as I mentioned, get it converted into a drug product, the, the finished dosage form more or less. And that drug product um, it, it certainly applies to the active pharmaceutical ingredient or the active uh, study drug, but it also applies to the finished dosage form that is the placebo. So you might not think that you know the placebo is is meets the definition of a drug product, but in fact it does. And uh, I'll, you know, talking here a little bit about the sourcing of the study drug, I covered the API piece, the drug product piece, where it's actually put into a finished dosage form, and then it's packaged into whatever the um, you know bottles, blisters, vials, um, whatever the uh, appropriate uh, primary container is. And it's important here when you're thinking about how to get your study drug uh, into a, a dosage form and then into a package that you select GMP compliant contract manufacturers um, because it's, it's the, the federal, again, the federal regulations that apply to the pharmaceutical industry also apply to this activity for clinical trial supplies. And to keep that um, uh, you know, contract manufacturer um, has some type of uh, certification or, or um, that they, they can provide that they do follow GMP regulations. As far as uh, some other things to think about uh, for sourcing, sourcing during your clinical trial are the non-drug products. And those would be you know, the, the kit boxes, the labels, any kind of accessories um, that you may need as far as you know, what, what the, those sites are going to need to conduct that clinical trial. So this, this is very important. We get a lot of investigators who come to us um, after their budget's in place and they're ready to start their trial and are a little taken aback when we mention the timeline. Um, and it's not described in days or weeks, but more, more, more along the lines of months. So if we were to start with trying to source an API, get it into a dosage form, um, get it into a package, and then get it labeled and into a kit, and ready for distribution to sites, we're looking at about six to nine months to accomplish that type of activity there. So it's something that, to start thinking about very early on in your planning of your clinical trial. So once you have, have your supply chain in place, you've, you've established who's going to be making your raw material, who's going to be you know, converting it into tablets, for example, getting it packaged, you need to keep it Keep in mind too here the quantities. How much are you going to need? So it's basically looking at the number of doses per day, time the number of dosing days, time the number of subjects. The uh, one thing to keep in mind here, as far as the dosing days, is to uh, allow for the visit window. And a lot of times the visit window is plus or minus seven days, plus or minus five days. So as you calculate those quantities, you, you may be, let's say, dosing for, uh, let's say, six months, and the patients come in every month for a, a new dispensing. And if the visit window is plus or minus, let's say, seven days, you need to add in to that month's supply another 14 days because the, the subjects, we need to allow for if they come in seven days early for one visit and seven days late for their next visit, you need to have that 14-day buffer uh, in addition to the month supply 
uh, that is the, the, contained in that kit. Also to, to uh, keep in mind that the, there's a, a necessary for an overage to accommodate any manufacturing loss, any damage, any, anything that uh, may happen, and it sure does, um, you know, with the material on its way to sites or while it's at a site. We usually hear when we build a budget and, and a plan for a study, uh, insert about a 30% overage of, of what it's going to take to, you know, if we were to do the study with 100% efficiency. So again, be thinking, all right, you, you have an amount you need, you've got everything taken into consideration, including the visit windows, and then let, to, to throw in another 30% into your, into your calculation and, and into your budget. The, um, the, a lot of times the, the duration of a study is such that it, a, a one and done approach isn't, isn't adequate. We need to keep in mind that if it's a, you know, a two, 18 month, two year, three year study, we need to, to think about the uh, shelf life of the material and keeping in mind the, the retest dates um, if, if the material doesn't have an established expiration date. So one, one thing, for, for example, if we're looking at a, um, let's say your study involves the uh, over-encapsulation of a, a commercial product, and a lot of times the commercial products have a shelf life of two to three years. So by the time you start to over-encapsulate it, you know, if you have 24 months left on it, hopefully maybe a little more, um, you get it over-encapsulated and in, uh, late in, in the packages labeled and in kits, you may be less than 24 months left uh, as far as the shelf life on that commercial product. So just to, to kind of keep in mind the overall duration of your study and how often you might need to uh, freshen the supply during the course of the study. And to keep in mind those lead times that I talked about a couple slides ago where you're allowing uh, several months to get a fresh uh, supply of study drug and have it available for, for distribution to the site. Um, other things as far as the forecasting, the, the storage constraints, um, a lot of times the, the, the space, and I'm maybe preaching to the choir here, but the, the space available at, at sites for the storage of clinical you know, study drug supplies is limited, especially when you're looking at refrigerated products. So again, to keep in mind how, how that uh, forecasting of when you need to re replenish the, the central drug supply uh, becomes very important. So the next this slide, we start to talk a little bit here about the blinding uh, versus open label studies. And the most common blinding methods for oral, solid oral dosage forms is to uh, over encapsulate those uh, with a larger capsule and then make a matching placebo capsule. And the, um, the, 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 once it's in those identical capsules, we take a look and perform a blindedness evaluation to ensure that the uh, dosage form and packaging and labeling are, are in fact going to maintain the uh, placebo controlled nature of that study, the blind of the study. So we're, we're looking at the capsules being identical, the bottles being identical, um, you know, the caps, everything, so that it's, it's really indistinguishable from a, a, a practitioner or a clinician standpoint and also a subject standpoint. And then the labeling equally is, is identical um, in order to maintain that blind. And the, the blinding extends all the way to, you know, the appearance of the, the material or the study drug, uh, the color. And a lot of times we're, where we're not looking necessarily at a uh, capsule or a tablet, but maybe a, a powder in a packet or a solution to make sure that the colors are um, uh, similar or identical uh, in, in appearance. And uh, we're currently working on a study where the raw material, the API, wasn't exactly, you know, one was kind of cream, one was kind of white. And so in order to try and make those identical, the idea was to let's throw a little color in to make those two identical. And as we're doing that, the amount of dye that was added, um, and in this case, the, you know, the, the dye selected was was uh, a yellow dye and I had to raise the point that we, let's be careful here uh, with the tartrazine sensitivity uh, that some subjects may have 
uh, as we try and blind these, we may solve the blind problem, but create another one. Uh, another example of that is we, we you know, had a study where we were um, creating a, a, a phenobarbital a placebo elixir for a, a pediatric study with infants. And the, the, um, the need there was that elixirs are alcohol-based by definition, and we had to find some type of alcohol substitute so that we didn't introduce unnecessarily introduce um, alcohol via the placebo in a pediatric population. Um, again, some other things to keep in mind here, the taste, smell, and texture. Um, all these, uh, you know, the, uh, the whole organoleptic test testing goes into, comes into play when we're uh, uh, trying to make sure that we maintain the blind of the, the study drug. Moving on to the, the labeling uh, piece of it, and now that we have our, our study drug in a bottle, uh, or in a capsule, in a bottle, and everything's identical, we're, we're confident that the blind has been, been taken care of. Uh, here's an example of a sample kit box label that we had done for a previous study. And it captures the information as far as the protocol, the name of the study, the study acronym, and um, the enrollment ID. And you can see here the contents describe it as six bottles of either the active study drug or the matching placebo. And again, this is where you know, it, it could contain either one and it's indistinguishable to the, uh, to the uh, uh, clinician or the subject. We do leave a little space here to, for the site to record the subject number that may be specific uh, to the site and, and then the date dispensed and the subject's initials. So uh, we can design these and, and, and need to think about having those in place and as far as how you want that to look and the information that needs to contain. Bottle label, very similar, except it takes it down to now we have the kit box number and then we have the, a, a bottle number for, in this case, each of the six bottles in the kit. So, you know, we have, we have the material labeled and it's blinded and now we're going to take a look at, we have a, a, a nicely blinded product. Now we have to make sure that the dosing regimens are, are blinded too, so that subjects in a, in a multi regimen uh, cl clinical trial are not, it's not revealed to them based on their dose, right, dosing regimen, what arm they might be in. And in this example, it's a three arm study where there's a placebo, 100 milligram and a 300 milligram arm. And we would set this up with a three bottle kit where subjects take one capsule from each of three bottles daily. And for the, for the placebo arm, there would be three placebo bottles, so they're always on the placebo dose, uh, the, the placebo regimen the whole time. The 100 milligram treatment arm, only one of their bottles would be active, and their other two bottles would be placebo. And again, they're taking one one capsule from each bottle every day. And then the 300 milligram treatment group would have all active bottles, so that everybody's taking one capsule from each bottle three times a day, but we're in a blinded fashion achieving the three different dosages. That's it's uh, you know easy to fairly straightforward in that example from the previous slide to think about how we're going to achieve those three doses or the three different dosage levels, and it gets a little more complicated sometimes when there's a titration phase involved, and we have to uh, be thinking about okay they're going to start out probably in that kind of situation taking just one bot or one capsule from bottle A for the first. Uh, for the first week, and then layer in the other uh, bottle, in this case, bottle B, for the second week, and, and, there, and then, you know, for the remainder of the study. So we want to, as, even as they titrate, we want the, the subjects to, make, to achieve their level of titration, but always be taking the same number of capsules from the same number of bottles. So here we, have, again, have a slightly different example of 150 milligram, 300 milligram of placebo, and we want the subjects to stop off and spend a week at 150 milligrams before moving on to a 300 milligram dose. And so that middle uh, 300 milligram arm there um, and, the, and the 150 milligram arm will each take one capsule like the placebo group from bottle A and then only the uh, uh, bottle B is active for the 300 milligram arm. So um, 
it was important for the design of this study to have everybody uh, have a 150 milligram a week at 150 milligrams. The same uh, reverse is, is also true that we need to be able to always um, have a dose reduction with while maintaining the blind. And again, we would discontinue the capsule. The first, in this example, the first reduction would occur by discontinuing taking the capsules from bottle A. And that would drop the 150 milligram uh, treatment arm all the way down to just placebo. It would drop the 300 milligram down to 150 milligrams a day. And then it wouldn't really affect the placebo since uh, placebo group since both our bottles are placebo. So an additional issues to keep in mind, and, and from a, a compliance standpoint, we uh, often uh, run into situations where we're working with a certain population where they, they may have uh, difficulty swallowing or a movement disorder. Uh, to keep in, keep in mind that the larger tablets and capsules may be problematic. It might be better to think about a liquid or um, balance at some times too, maybe going with more of a smaller tablet and capsule or capsule instead of trying to uh, you know, go with a, a fewer number of larger tablets or capsules uh, for each dose. Additionally, the packaging is, is a real big uh, factor for some of our, our studies. We do a lot of work here in the area of neurology and movement disorders. So um, we're very aware that for some uh, movement disorders uh, and mobility impaired subjects, that blister packs are a real challenge for them to try and push a capsule through a blister or foil uh, out of a blister pack. Child resistant bottles present a heck of a, a, a this, um, problem sometimes. And then also too, in order to satisfy the regulatory requirements, we often need to cram a lot of a text onto a very small space uh, of the label. And uh, oftentimes it's, it meets the regulatory requirements, but is um, difficult for the, uh, the subjects and their caregivers to be able to, to read those labels. So just some things to keep in mind as you, uh, you know, the sort of the ease of uh, our user friendliness of the, uh, of the, of both the formulation and the packaging. So I, I mentioned earlier about primary and secondary packaging. As you work with your contract manufacturers, you're, you're going to hear uh, reference to the primary package, and that is the container that, that holds the dosage form. That's the bottle that holds the tablet or capsules, the, the vial that holds the, the uh, solution. And that's really the, um, uh, the, the barrier, I guess, that would um, make sure that the product's uh, potency and, and purity uh, are maintained um, while that material is in the unopened container. So primary packaging the dosage form in the in the bottle, the secondary packaging. Oops, excuse me. Let me let me spend a little more time with primary packaging. There's several different types here. You know, the glass bottles, um, whether they're amber or clear. Um, we go with the amber route when there's some light sensitivity involved. Then there's the polymer or the plastic bottles, blister packs, tubes, sprays, pumps. So there's a variety of different primary containers that may come into play for your study drug. So once we get the material into the, the primary package, and um, if, it's, if it's not commercial material, material that you're using straight from a commercial container in probably an unblinded study or an open label study, you know, we've had to do something to that product in order to maintain the blind of the study. So once we've altered a commercial product by over encapsulating it and, and mixing with a little bit of inert ingredients, we need to uh, make sure that the integrity of the product is, is still intact. So what we what will often or what was, was required, especially for studies that are being performed under an IND, is that you have a, a material followed on a stability program, and that's a list of tests that that really assures us at various points throughout the study um, that the uh, material is is going to maintain its integrity and, and therefore assure that the results of the study are in fact reliable. So if we again alter it in any way and that alteration in, you know, can be as little as taking material from a 100 count bottle and repackaging it into 25 count bottles. Once it's out of its original approved container, if you're working with a, some type of commercial product, 
you need to do some testing to assure that whatever you've done to it, even repackaging it, is going to maintain the stability of the product. And there are, there are different types of stability programs available uh, or that we, are commonly used. Um, the ambient conditions where we're at 25C and 60 relative humidity, that once we have some assurance that that material is behaving well for 12 months, um, then we, we are, have some confidence that it's going to you know, behave well at longer periods of time. There's a couple other conditions, intermediate and accelerated. A lot of times what we'll do when we need to get a study up and running and we don't really have the time to leave something on stability for six or 12 months before getting a study or getting the study started, we'll go ahead and, and get uh, put some product that's been packaged into accelerated conditions where we you know, store it under stressed or high temperature 40C and 75 relative humidity. And by seeing how it behaves for 30 days at accelerated conditions, that's a bit of a predictor that you know that it's probably going to be okay for at least six to 12 months at ambient conditions. So um, you may see when you're working with contract manufacturers and contract labs, the recommendation to go ahead and obtain some data at accelerated conditions so that you can point to that as as to you know that we we have some feeling that it's going to documentation that it's going to be good for six to 12 months at least, and then follow it longer for um, under ambient conditions, maybe testing every six months to ensure that it, it's behaving as expected. So uh, another type of uh, date or, or that, that pertains to shelf life, we have expiration dates with that are fixed for commercial products. And um, the retest date is uh, sort of a, I guess, uh, a moving or a revolving uh, expiration date where we don't have an established retest date, or excuse me, an established expiration date. And so at those different intervals that we test at in a stability program, once we get assurance that material, let's say, behaved okay for 18 months, we'll then, um, and the next time point is 24 months, we can go ahead and extend the retest date out to that time point where it's going to be where it's going to be tested next. So um, you'll often see as, as in, with working with investigational products that there's a retest date involved. And in the United States, uh, there's not a requirement, regulatory requirement to put an expiration or, or retest date on the label. If you go to other countries, other um, the EU, for example, they require that their labeling include um, an expiration date or a retest date. And as you can imagine, if you're working with a retest date and you actually have to change the date that's on the label, that gets pretty involved. Um, so it's uh, fortunately the, the uh, US doesn't require that that, li that date, whether it's retest or expiration, appear on the label. I think I've already covered a lot of this as far as the expiration date. That date is established based on a, a body of of stability data that the pharmaceutical company has, has gathered over time. So they make sure that if it has a three year shelf life, they've got a high level of confidence that it's going to be good for longer than three years. Um, but they assign the three year shelf life just to make sure that there's uh, plenty of, uh, I guess, slack in that the uh, material stays within specification and doesn't start to drift out as it approaches its expiration date. The date, the expiration date is typically two to three years. And then the important thing to keep in mind um, is that once that primary container has been opened, that uh, product, uh, the integrity of the product or the, that the shelf life is no longer guaranteed. So that, that the expiration date is based on containers that aren't opened. Um, once you open that container, then you, you start to lose some, some certainty around whether or not that expiration date is really going to apply. Some of the analytical testing that's done um, when we you know, put material up at, uh, on a stability program or test the material at time of release, and there's some examples here as far as we may look at, the, uh, we'll, we'll look at the disintegration, the dissolution. We'll uh, do an, uh, the lab will do an assay on it to make sure that the uh, percent of active um, ingredient is, is present um, throughout the testing duration. 
we'll also do an assay on the placebo product to make sure there's a lack of active product. Uh, as you can imagine, that a lot of the same equipment is used if you're going to manufacture active and placebo capsules, for example. And we want to make sure that the, the material has been cleaned uh, appropriately between the active and the placebo. So we'll actually assay the placebo to make sure there's a 0% of active in there. And, and this is the, the reason why when the contract manufacturers make the capsules uh, active and placebo, they sometimes will make the placebo first to ensure that, um, you know, that the, there's, there's no active material that's possibly missed the, by the cleaning when they go to make the placebo. So placebo first, followed by active. We'll do some micro testing and um, you know that both both for solid oral dosage forms and for for uh, liquid formulations and then for liquid formulations we'll do some what's called prefer preservative effectiveness testing and that basically um, ensures that the uh, preservative in place will um, pres the preservative system will guard against the material becoming contaminated while in use so as you as a subject dispenses out of a let's say a four ounce bottle, um, their liquid dosage form, that preservative effectiveness will test to ensure that as the subject opens and closes that, um, that bottle, that the uh, preservative system will maintain that uh, material free of, of con contamination for the period of time while it's in use. So I mentioned early that we, earlier that we we're gonna talk about some of the durations within the study and how to how to uh, take those into consideration when planning the drug supply for your study and the, the one thing we run into most frequently as far as the duration that's difficult to get you know that is, is often uh, difficult to predict and and sometimes um, the tendency is to be a little optimistic up front as far as how long it's going to take uh, to enroll the, the desired number of subjects and it's, it's in, just incredibly important to be a realistic when trying to estimate that date because I, uh, so many times we've seen studies start where the uh, team thinks that enrollment is going to take 12 months and we can get by with just a single batch of active and placebo study drug. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes that you know shelf life may be two years. So you know, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to enroll in a year treat for six months, I'll be done in 18 months, two years is going to be plenty. Well, enrollment goes a little longer than expected. And uh, next thing you know, that we have a single batch of study drug that is going to expire before the last patient's out. And if that wasn't budgeted for and planned for up front, it's, it's a, uh, becomes a real problem um, because it's, it, it's having to go and find the funds to continue the study while the study is ongoing. And uh, I guess, most of you, all of you know, that's uh, not, a, not a simple task. So we typically recommend if, if a study is going to, um, you know, be 18 to 24 months in duration, and, and, and that's a realistic 18 to 24 months, then we'll go ahead and, and um, um, recommend that we plan for a second uh, campaign of study drug so that we can freshen the stock during the course of the study. So that's, uh, again, something to keep in mind, despite how optimistic uh, everyone may be around how quickly the study is going to enroll. Again, in bold letters here, that is really the single biggest challenge we encounter. Um, we'd much rather be surprised by a study that enrolls more quickly than planned and maybe not need that second campaign than they have to chase the funds to try and have that second campaign uh, performed during, during the study. Um, one thing too, to, and, and there's, and we, we're seeing this more often, and we're trying to um, to advise our, our clients. There's often so much pressure for that first patient in, and focus on getting that first of let's say 20 sites up and running, and then the second site may not come on for another three or four months, but you've you know, you've met that milestone where you've got your first patient in at your first site, and the problem here is that. Um, you know, while that first, you know, until that second site comes on board over the next, you know, three months, let's say, the shelf life is just ticking away. And we try and encourage our, our um, clients to uh, take an approach where let's try and have as many sites as possible uh, ready up front so that they can all begin taking advantage of that uh, limited shelf life 
versus having just one site um, using that uh, initial batch of product. And then suddenly, you know, by the time all the sites are on board, you may only have six months of shelf, shelf life yet. And um, if you have a, a treatment duration of six months, well, your, your back's against the wall already for those sites that are coming on toward the end. Um, the schedule activities and, and, and visit window considerations. I, I think I um, touched on this a little bit earlier, but a couple more thoughts um, to keep in mind here when you're designing your study and how it's going to impact uh, study drug supply. Uh, to, it's important to try and standardize the interval of dispensing visits as much as possible. Um, it's, uh, it, it just you know, works out really, really well if we can be consistent through the course of the study too. So is, um, the uh, first example or the first bullet here, as far as standardizing those visits, we may um, dispense or design some a, 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 a kit and, um, and we want that when we design a kit, we want that kit to be suitable for um, the visits, the first visit to the study all the way through to the end of the study. So Oftentimes, uh, you know, when a study starts, the subject may come in at baseline, maybe month one, month three, and then month six or whatever. Um, and so we'll design a six-month kit um, for use throughout the course of the study. But what will happen for that first six months when subjects are coming in two or three times, only a few bottles out of that kit will be dispensed at each dispensing visit. A lot of times when this situation occurs, let's say it's a, a you know, a 24-month study and then you know they come in multiple times over the first six months and then every six months thereafter then they'll get the full kit um, for their their six 12 and, and 18 month study or 18 month visit important as I, I mentioned a little bit earlier the maintain the consistent visit window uh, because of that plan where we we have to account for a kit uh, uh, bottle size or capsule count let's say where we need to accommodate that plus or minus seven days by having an extra 14 day supply in there. Uh, we have had some studies where early on when the, the visits are more frequent to go ahead and, and just have a plus or minus seven days. And then once you're out to every six month visits, widen that to plus or minus 14 days. Well, that, that causes problems from the standpoint that we can't use, well, we can, you know, the, the, the kit needs to be built to accommodate that plus or minus 14 day window. And so now you got to have 28 days of extra drug in a, in a six month kit. And, and a lot of that has the potential to go to waste. So to, to keep the um, visit window as narrow as possible, as, as practical as possible for your study is, is always a good thing. Um, let's see, I think that's uh, just one more example down here. Um, uh, a three month kit, a three month kit or a three month window here is you know, 13 weeks or 91 days. So we'll go ahead then, and if it's a plus or minus five day visit window, each of those kits will need to have 101 day supply in it. Now we, we have uh, an understanding for the uh, visit window and the, and the, and the uh, what needs to be contained in the kit to satisfy the, uh, the various visits and, and dispensing visits. It's important now to keep in mind the storage conditions and whether or not you're working with material that requires frozen storage, refrigerated, room temperature, if it's light sensitive, for example, uh, moisture sensitive. The uh, transportation piece of this is, is critical in that uh, a lot of times when you're working with frozen and refrigerated material, you need to make sure that there's temperature controls either in the vehicle that's being used to transport the study drug, or more commonly we'll use a, a, a pack, pack the material into a, a cold chain shipper that'll maintain those conditions while inside a, a FedEx or UPS truck. And in red down here, again, you know, keep in mind too that the um, sites may have limited storage capabilities and to, to you know, plan on, let's say, more frequent shipments of product out to site rather than large bulky shipments out to sites. Um, it's, it's a balancing act. The shipments are expensive, but the uh, storage space available at sites is also a premium. When we're, when we're handling material that's uh, even ambient, we do monitor some ambient shipments, but mostly frozen and refrigerated. We'll have a temperature monitoring device in the uh, that we'll use and, and, and insert that 
in the uh, shipper that we're using that will monitor the temperature during the uh, during the while the material is in transit. And here's an example of what one of the, the most common device that we use. It's called a temp tail device. And you can see here that there's a, a green start button that we press when we put it into the shipper. And then we seal it up. And then there's the stop button that the sites will press when they receive it. The cord with the USB port is attached to a computer at the site. And these work really well in that on this next slide. They'll print out or they'll generate a report that shows uh, toward the bottom there, you see that graph where there's the blue line, that kind of, you know, the wavy blue line. It stays within the two red lines, and that assures us that the material be, you know, was, was at the proper storage conditions while in transit. That report can then be printed um, for the regulatory files, and also um, we require that a PDF of that report be sent back to us to ensure that we have uh, documentation that the shipment uh, arrived at the site with the proper storage conditions maintained. Drug accountability, uh, getting toward the end here, um, needs to occur throughout the entire supply chain. So we're tracking, we're maintaining accountability you know, through the API piece, the packaging piece, the um, labeling, kit assembly, distribution piece. We need to make sure that there's the SOPs in place uh, at the sites to address how they address uh, drug accountability. Um, each site probably does it a little bit differently, but they achieve the same outcome. You may need, some sites may, may need a little help um, with developing their dispensing and accountability logs, and they're pretty easy to, to, to generate or to design. It's, it's uh, I guess, most like a checkbook where you receive in a certain kit, you know, list of kits, um, you uh, document the date and who received those. And then in, in that checkbook type of approach, each kit has its own line. Uh, and then you date an initial when it was dispensed and date an initial when it was returned from the subject. And here's, here's an example of, of that sort of checkbook approach for a drug accountability where each, each kit uh, has its own line. And then there's, as I mentioned, the, the different columns that would capture the information associated with uh, receipt, dispensing, and return. So we're getting toward the end of the study, and we have to think about now how we're going to dispose of the materials that are, are both um, at the sites and then also that might be remaining at the depot or, or the central inventory. And in order to be as cost conscious as possible from, a, from your budget standpoint, and if you're working with a multi-center trial, it's often best to try and see if the, uh, to, to um, have the sites accept the responsibility for the, the destruction of the materials um, that are remaining at their site. Um, they can also return them to the distributor or return them to a, a third party company. But once that final monitoring visit has been performed at a site, uh, the, the materials at the site need to be disposed of in one of those three methods. Um, and then the materials that are remaining at the central inventory, and, and that's what we are here at the at Clinical Materials Services Unit, we're the, the central inventory. We either um, coordinate the destruction of that material, and, and oftentimes that's the way it goes because the shelf life is so limiting, or we return the material to the sponsor uh, if there's a, a need or usability of, uh, remaining in the material. Okay, let's see. Let me go back a little bit. I think that's uh, toward the end of what I have. Um, Here's some references as to where um, the information that uh, I, I included here as far as some of the regulatory backup. And I think I can turn it back over to Sam at this point for for the uh, this, uh, CME piece of, of the, pres uh, the presentation or webinar. Yes. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Pat, for that great talk. Uh, are there any questions? You can use the chat box um, if you have any questions. I'll give it a moment. Okay. Okay, I don't see any questions. Um, so I, I just want to thank you again, Pat, for uh, joining us today and giving the, the wonderful talk. 
Um, for anyone who's interested in webinars, uh, or in webinars, in CMEs, please um, complete the evaluation form. The link is right there. You can also click browse to in the web links box, should be on the bottom left of your screen. Um, so yes, please evaluate the web webinar, give us feedback um, because your feedback helps to improve the series. Um, today's webinar is eligible for one AMA PRA credit one credit. Um, and if you wish to claim the credit, you'll be asked to provide an email address on the evaluation form, and then the CMEs will be provided at the end of the series in November. And we'll post the um, slides and the webinar video on the course website, which is listed there. And our next webinar is on July 21st at the same time, 12 p.m. Eastern, and the topic will be about data management and presented by uh, Catherine Dillon. So uh, thank you, Pat, again, and thank you for all of the, um, for everyone for joining. And we'll thank see you, you next week.